Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to worship you, may your grace be with us and help us, Lord, to acknowledge that you are indeed our God and our Savior. This is our prayer, for we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, children. Jesus had a team of 12 disciples when he was on earth who went everywhere with him. And when it was time for them to go out without him, Jesus sent them out in teams of two. He gave them instructions to not pack anything, but rather to depend on the kindness of people who invited them into their homes. Now, why do you think the disciples work and travel in teams? Yes, you guess it right. He knew that it would be difficult and lonely to work alone. Can you imagine going out to a strange place and meeting people for the first time all by yourself? Meeting strangers and maybe unfriendly people can be quite frightening. What if I'm hungry or tired or sick on my journey? Who do I go to? Who do I depend? Yes, Jesus knew that the disciples needed each other and that they could encourage and pray for each other. Jesus also wanted to teach the disciples not to rely only on themselves, but a community, a team in the body of Christ, which is the church. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9-12, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Let me show you something. I have a string here. This is one string. What happens if I try to break this? Can I break this? Let me try, okay? Yeah, I can break it. This is one string that's broken. What happens if I have one, two, three strings? Okay, this is mentioned in the Bible verse I just read. It says a cord of three strands. This is three strands, three strings. Now, can I break this? Let me try. Now, it's very difficult to break this. It, I don't think I can break this at all. So th with this simple illustration, with this simple uh, showing of these strings, we know that when we are alone, when there's only one person, it's not easy. We can break like the strings. Okay, when we can get discouraged easily, there's no one to help us. But when we have friends, we are not alone. Okay, we are not alone. We have people around us. We have a community. We have a team that is together with us. We are strong. So children, let's remember this, that when we are together, when we are a team, when we are in unity, we are strong. Our scripture reading for today is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. May God bless the reading and the meditation of His Word. Good morning and blessed Sabbath to all of us. And on behalf of our church, we would like to welcome everyone once again.
to our worship service this Sabbath. And before we are going to explore into the Word of God, I would like to invite us to bow ahead for a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Father God, we would like to ask that your presence will be with us and may your mercy will be with us. That your grace will be shown in all the things that we are going to explore in the scripture that we are going to read and learn together. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now before the pandemic hits the world in the early part of this year, I actually came across a few articles upon this interesting trend that happened across the world where people from first world country started to settle down and even become citizens upon many of these so-called third world countries across the world. This trend is especially very common among the people from the Western world who come and settle down in Asia. To say even in Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, and many other countries. And so upon the, the studies that they have done, they, they interview all these Westerners, all these people who came from a very advanced nation, and yet willing to settle down in a more rugged countries, such as Indonesia and so on and so forth. They ask them, what are the things that make you want to stay and even considering to become a citizen of our country? So first of all, they said that we want to uh, stay in your country because of the beauty of the nature. We love the scenery, we love the nature, we love the mountain, we love all these things that we saw in your country. And they said, and, and uh, the interviewer, uh, uh, interviewer asked them and said, well, those things are not technically unique to our own country. There are many other countries who are able to provide such beautiful nature as well. And so some of these people who were interviewed then said, oh, there are other reasons why we want to settle down and to stay in your country. And yet, they said, one of the most important reasons why they want to settle down is because they said, oh, we enjoy so much the community spirit, the kampong lifestyle, to say, the, the, the feelings of being part of a community that we didn't feel back home. That somehow when we are in your country, people are so friendly. They're so hospitable. People greet us, even strangers allow us to come to, to their house and stay with them. And so because of this culture that they didn't experience back home, where people are probably very cold, they are very uh, not friendly, people just taking care of their own business, and people are just doing their own thing. Many of these people who came down and settled down in actually a less privileged country than, than their own find something that they couldn't find in their own place. And as this trend, uh, this trend now entered into the new era of this COVID-19 pandemic, some of them even said, oh, to be honest with you, I'd rather stay in this place of yours than back home in my own home country. Because here, yes, maybe the hospital is not as good and advanced as my country. But I felt that I'm not alone. Throughout the lockdown period, throughout the, um, when I have to be isolated alone, there are many people who are very concerned about me, sending food, sending all kinds of things that I need, that I felt that I'd rather stay here during lockdowns rather than back home in my own place. And so as we... Look up as, as they took upon some of these studies and they learned together on why some of these people who came from a more privileged country and willing to stay in a lesser privileged country have expressed. It seems that it portrays something that many of us probably here, here even in Singapore had felt many times. And that is that uh, there is this lack of warm community where people can just feel that they belong to a people who are friendly, loving, and able to relate with you. Many times, as many people have expressed, one of the challenges of being in a first world, you know, very modern country, is that they are losing that sense of togetherness. They are losing that sense of community. They are losing that sense of being as part of a group of people that 
are basically just like a family. In a world that we are living today, even in Singapore, you may notice that people really take care of themselves. Individual matters is more important often than the company spirit, the community spirit, I mean. That somehow we felt that my, my, my concern, my need, my problem are so much that I don't have time to take care of other people's problems. Just take a look upon how we relate to each other. Sometimes even here in this place, I mean, I'm not talking about our church, but I'm talking we as a community. Many times, we don't even know who our neighbor is. We don't even know the name of, our, um, of the people living on the same floor like ours. Oftentimes, we don't even know the person who lives beside our block. This spirit of being concerned over our own self seems to be quite prevalent that many times we lost that spirit of community. The question is, how about our church? How about the church? And as we look upon this very sensitive yet very important question, there is no other place that we, can, we should go other than as we look upon the scripture. And so as this morning, as we are going to explore, to look upon our church as a community, I would like to invite us to go back to the New Testament model in which the first church has established that community spirit that I think is very necessary for our church today. And as we're going to open this Bible passage in the book of Acts chapter 2, I would like to invite you from wherever you are, if you can look upon the screen, it's written in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 47. But if you cannot see, or probably the font is too small from your perspective, I would like to invite you to open your own Bible and take a look upon this book of Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 47. Now, I have highlighted here on the screen upon, I think, words that are very important in this passage. But let us read it together. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. As you look upon this passage, you will notice how many times that the writer of the book of Acts, which we believe as uh, Luke, Dr. Luke, had highlighted the fact that they were doing things together as a community. From the very beginning of the verse, verse 44, you know, you mentioned, you notice there that the words, uh, the, the statement started with this statement, they were together. And then they had all things in common. Once again, a word that is related to a, a community spirit. And then they sell their possession and divided them among all. So there is this very strong spirit of charity. And then what followed after? It said that continuing daily with one accord, showing the spirit of unity and breaking bread from house to house. Of course, right now we cannot do this uh, because of the pandemic. But as we look upon this, the, the, the passage, you notice that they are basically having this, uh, this, this tradition of visiting houses and just enjoy the fellowship with every believers. And then they have this gladness and simplicity of heart. And as the result of this model, as the result of this spirit that they carry on, the church grow not weekly, not monthly, not yearly, but what? As you look upon it, daily. That someone comes to church daily. Someone joining the community daily. Something that we rarely see in our modern world of today. We are very happy if we can get at least two to three baptisms a year. But as you look upon the book of Acts chapter 2, 
It is very interesting to see that they have people coming, new people keep coming to the church daily. Something that I think all of us here in our church would like to have to see it happening. And yet, as you look upon the way they have done church back then, the model that the Bible had written for us seems to show that it all laid upon their spirit as people coming together as a community. It didn't mention about a specific pastors who went and preached and finally people come and thousands were baptized. It didn't talk about a specific telecom, uh, televangelist or there is a specific program that people come and because of that program, people became believers of Jesus Christ. But rather, it all being done by the people who claim themselves as the community of believers. They are coming together and build this warm community that built this sense of togetherness that brings people to the church. And I wonder that it is interesting to know that there are nothing being mentioned about the things that you will listen to and you will look upon it as well. Number one, it didn't mention anything about good facilities. The pastors didn't mention anything about a beautiful church, a nice place, a place where they are very comfortable inside. The pastors didn't mention about expensive equipment. The, the passage didn't mention about good lighting, nice camera, even though I really appreciate the fact that today, as you notice, our live stream is much better because we have uh, better lighting uh, facilities uh, this Sabbath. I hope that you will notice it and please express our appreciation, your appreciation to the people background um, to, who had done all these things to improve our live streaming. But interestingly enough, that the, the book of Acts didn't mention about good facilities as the reason of their growth daily. It didn't mention about fantastic, uh, fantastic worship service, where there are skillful song leaders, expert musicians, excellent sound system, and so on and so forth. It didn't mention about a very interesting program either. The passage didn't say about a very well-organized seminar or a very high-caliber speaker, a professor from a very well-known university who come and speak, or it's a very famous um, youth leaders who come and give, uh, conduct a program. It didn't even mention about any attractive individuals. It didn't mention about charismatic preachers. It didn't mention about a famous church member. As you look upon the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 44 to 47, there is no name being mentioned there. No name of Peter, no name of Andrew, no name of any of the disciples of Jesus. Apparently, that the secret formula of growth, according to the book of Acts chapter 4, chapter 2, verse 44 to 47, did not include any of these elements that oftentimes we took as something that is critical to the growth of a church. But rather, as I going to as we're going to look upon it. It seems that their secret of growth laid upon something that is even deeper than all these things. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that good infrastructure, a good uh, technology, very organized system, a wonderful speaker, a well-organized program are not important. I'm, I believe that all those things are important, but apparently they are not important enough that the writers of Acts felt that there are more important things that he needs to write in the book of Acts in order for the readers of the Bible to understand what are the secrets of their growth. And the book of Acts had mentioned to us that why the church grow daily? It is because of something else. And as we look upon the passage, it is quite clear to see that the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is not only given to the infrastructure of the church, it is not given to the technology of the church, but rather it's in the people of the church. That the Holy Spirit, as it comes in the earlier part of the passage, manifested in the people, that they start to become as a community. They built this group of believers, and they grow together, and they became the first church. As you look upon the passage once again, you will notice, like what I have mentioned in the beginning, that it is because of their community spirit 
because of their togetherness, because of the spirit of community and as, the, as people who believe in God coming together. That is when the church grows daily. And so, this Acts model that has been written as the truth of God in the Bible, as we grow into a more robust uh, um, church right now, there are many important research being done to back upon this biblical truth that the Acts model, it is indeed the key for church not only to remain survival, survive, but to grow daily. The first research came from this idea that when they go and study about churches across different places, they found out that actually structure alone is not enough for the church to grow. Now we have been talking about the young people for the last few Sabbaths. And so today I would like to re-emphasize this idea. And please don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that they are the only people that are important in church. But rather, like I have mentioned in the first few Sabbaths of this quarter, that many of us had expressed, Pastor, we are getting very tired of running the church. You know, I'm already at this age. I'm supposed to retire and enjoy my time being at the, as a church as one of the congregations alone. But unfortunately, because of there is no regeneration, I still have to do it. And so, you and I know that the only hope that we can see happening for the regeneration to happen is that we have enough young people, and I'm talking about youth and young adults, able to stay and find that they are important, but also the church is important in their spiritual life. So all this research that I'm going to show this morning is based upon the studies being done to observe and study many of the young people in different places. And so they noticed that structures alone is not the only thing that will sustain the church. So Fuller Youth Institute had conducted these studies, and they asked all these young people, age 13 all the way to age 30, and they asked this simple question, what words will you use to describe a church? that you will consider to belong to. And notice the top six words that they have indicated as the place where they will come and stay in the church. The church that are welcoming. Churches that are welcoming. Those churches that are accepting. And then the sense of belonging is very strong. The church that are very authentic the church that are hospitable, and the church that is caring. Now you can notice, none of these words there talks about music. None of the words that they are mentioned there talks about program. None of those words being mentioned there talks about aircon building. None of those church uh, being mentioned there talks about all these things that oftentimes we think will attract and make our youth stays in church. Apparently, as we look upon all these things, the church that all these young people will consider to stay are the church that are welcoming, church that are accepting, church that they feel belong, church that are authentic, means people are just the way they are. They don't try to portray a certain persona, but yet doing another things another way behind the scenes. They, who they are is the one that they see each and every day in church. The church that are hospitable, very welcoming and opening their place for them to feel very comfortable coming together. And the church that are caring means that the problems that they face, and I'm talking about the church, means not only specific individuals. They're talking about the whole community as one coming together to support them and care for them. These churches continue to... Um, then another study is being done, and this time they look upon the people, the young people, who are staying in church. So oftentimes, we, we always ask the question, and researchers oftentimes like to ask those youth and young adults who left the church why they left. But these studies take another angle. Instead of asking all those youth and young, young adults who left, they are basically asking those people who are still staying in church and ask them, why are you still staying? 
And so they have divided it into two groups of people and look upon the result that has been shown from this study. From age 19 to 23, 45% said that it is personal relationship with members of the church that made them stay in their church. But interestingly, more interestingly than that, is that when the study is being done to an older generation, those young people who are considered as young adults, age 30 and above, uh, as you look up on the screen, you can see how many of them saying that personal relationship with someone in church helps them to stay longer in church or help them remain in church while the rest of their peers have left. 80% of them said it is because of personal relationship with someone in church. Not personal relationship with the pastors alone. Not only a personal relationship with few individuals in church but they feel that the church is a community at large, that they feel that everyone in church are very warm and caring and loving, and because of that, they are willing to stay in the church. I'm not trying to say that our Adventist truth doesn't matter anymore. It's just about building community. It is just about being a warm people. It is about being a nice, kind community. No, but rather, as some of this research have shown even further, is that they want to see that the biblical truth that we believe now being manifested in the practical life that they see through an authentic, genuine relationship with others in the church. That they felt that somehow, oh, this is what the truth means. This is what being Adventist means. This is what being the last day, last day means. This is what it means to be part of God's remnant. Because otherwise, they felt like, oh, we call ourselves as remnant, but it seems like we do not believe in a remnant teaching that we are one together, looking forward for the day when Jesus comes again. And as they look upon more and more studies, another one comes and asks this question and said that when they were asked, young people, when it referred to the, they here refer to the young people, they say that what makes your church effective with young people? Only a quarter of them said that worship is important. Then another 12% only saying that music it is important for them to stay in church. And then among all those top churches who seem to grow very fast, they notice that only actually 3% among those young adults who believe that worship style is important for them to remain in church. When they were asked about how would you describe your church to your friend, again, similar numbers comes in. Only 12% mention that worship is the main description of their church. And only 9% mention that worship style is very important to make them introduce their friends to their church. And in all findings, it is interesting to know that one out of three respondents shared that the way that they will tell the people out there about their church is this, that my church is very warm. As the most important factor for them to reach out to the people out there. That is why ever since the beginning of my um, Ministry and people have been asking about this question about what is the most important thing for our church. I always believe that people are more important than other things. People are more important than any other parts of the church. We may not have the most sophisticated technology, but the people behind it are more important than the technology. We may not have the most stru well-structured, a very organized system in doing church. But I have to be honest with all of you, I believe people behind that are more important than the structure. And therefore, and therefore as we look upon the book of Acts just now, and as we look upon all this research that had been done, I hope that you and I can come to the same perspective that people are indeed 
more important than many other things. And that is the reason why I personally believe that it is not a drum set that we will bring to church and make them happy to be entertained in church that will make them stay in our church. A drum set will not keep our church in church, uh, our youth in church, or at least the majority of them. But I personally believe that a warm, loving community as a church will make them stay. They don't need a fanciful worship service. They don't need a sophisticated worship service. They don't need such powerful music system to make them find a place in church. Those things may encourage them to come. Those things may encourage them to do something, but it's not necessarily make them stay. Why? Because you can have a full drum set and they can play about it every week. But if we continue to criticize and say that, oh, the way you play drum is not like that. The play you, you, you beat the drum is not like that. It's not going to solve anything. What the church needs is a warm, loving community where each one of them will feel that they are not only an individual being only noticed when they come to church because of their clothing, because of their dress, because of their style, because of their makeup, because of the way they talk to us, but rather because they are people that are important to us, that we are willing to talk and share their stories with us. It is that warm, loving community that will make them stay. And that cannot be done by only few individuals who are working with them. I do not go against the idea to have a youth pastor, to have a youth-oriented pastor, to have a youth sponsor, to have a youth coordinator, and so on and so forth. But let's stop putting too much emphasis on structure. Let us stop trying to create an organized way simply to cover and to solve a problem. What they need is not just another adult with a title to go with them but rather more and more adults going with them even if they have no name, no title, they are not being appointed by the church as a youth coordinator and so on and so forth. What we need is a stronger community, not a more organized system. What we need is you and I are going to extend and to reach out to them and say that you are important for us. I'm here to listen to you. You, are, you matters to me. Because I personally believe it is not system, structure, equipment, or anything else that will make them stay. But it is how we treat them. How you and I will come together and work our heart in and out to allow them to realize that, hey, this church is a warm, loving community. I enjoy being in this place. You know, this uncle will come and just talk to me. That auntie will just provide food for me even though I do not know even who she is. That, that man over there looks very unfriendly, but apparently when I talk to him, he will share his stories with me. These are the more important things rather than more and more appointment of a youth coordinator. Because we don't need a title to be able to minister well to them. We don't need a church board endorsement in order for us to be able to reach and love them the way we need to love them. All that we need is to ask the Lord to say, Lord, for the sake of my young people in church, so they will replace me from doing all these ministries that I have done all these years. All that I need to do is just to love them. Just to love them. That's all that I need. That's all the things that I need to do. I just need to show them that I love them. I just need to show them that I care for them. I don't need to be, in, to be approved by the church board uh, or any committees to, to, to join and to minister to these young people. I just need to love them. And I believe that once we take this idea from the Bible and from the research that we have shown just now, on how we should do our church, I believe we will see more and more of them coming and being involved in our ministry. 
Because just take notice on how people will say things during church farewell. You know, many times we have to bid farewell to some of our fellow church members, probably because they have to move overseas, because of studies, because of duties, because they need to go home, and so on and so forth. How many times that you have, sit, you have sat in a church farewell and people will say, oh, we would like to thank you, Ballastier, for the beautiful and comfortable pew that we have been sitting all the years that we have been in Ballastier. We would like to thank you, we would like to thank Ballastier for the comfortable air conditioner system that have helped us to worship well with Ballastier Church. We would like to thank you for the never broke down mics uh, and PA system that we enjoyed so much, very rarely. But what will people usually say during the time of farewell? Oh, we feel very welcome here. We will miss the uh, brother A. We will miss eating with sister B. We will miss uh, having our children play with the children of family, this and that. That will be the things that people will say, right? It is because at the end of the day, it is the community that will encourage people to stay. We may not have the best equipment for our church. We may not have the most sophisticated system to support our church. We may not have even the highest budget to share with each other. But that was not the concern of the New Testament church. When they don't have money, what do they do? They just sell their stuff and share it with one another. It is not such a big problem for them. Because they would like to emphasize and they would like to put their attention more into building a community even when they don't have anything much to share with. Because the Spirit, as you look upon the verse just now, Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 47, they are giving thanksgiving in everything and they have enjoyed the simplicity of Spirit. And so today, as we look upon this formula of the New Testament church. I would like to ask us to go back and let us look again upon this idea that the church has established which is inspired by the Holy Spirit that came upon them. First of all, they were together. Acts chapter 2, verse 44 mentioned that they were together. There is this spirit of togetherness. They are not a group of cliques coming together in one place to worship the church in the church together but rather every one of them are part of a community that really love one another. They are not just having their groups of friends and they only stick with those friends, but as a whole, they are all coming together to worship God. They had things in common. This is the spirit of sharing, that acknowledging that the interests of many are more important than the, my personal interest. They divide them among all. The spirit of charity that I have mentioned just now. That they see that by being together as one, they are willing to share whatever they have, whether it's big or small, doesn't matter. But we are, they, they are willing and able to see that as a church, let us share whatever we have. Let us do with the best that we could. Let us share whatever that we can share because we are indeed a church. They are living in one accord in the temple. They are bringing, breaking bread from house to house, which is the spirit of fellowship where they come and they enjoy whether it's a, just a simple meal or it's just a simple fellowship. They don't bother with so much of the details that at the end of the day actually are basically a minor things. They ate their food with gladness. Now, for many of us, you know, you have received the document from Pastor Johnny uh, that mentioned that soon and very, very soon, the service will resume in our church here in Ballastier. So some of our fellow uh, church members mentioned to me, oh, Pastor, you know, people had been asking about, you know, coming back to church, you will get ready that soon they will ask, oh, so pastor, when will be the potluck will come back and resume in church as well? Now, I would like, and I hope, that the moment when they will allow potluck to come back to our church once again, there will be no complaints.
but rather we will look upon the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and ate their food with gladness. So whether there will be only rice and egg on that day, or whether there will be only rice, egg, and one vegetable of that day, let us eat with gladness. Rather than, oh, how come you don't bring? How come you only cook like that? How come you don't even notice that we you know there are so many optional? Let's reduce these ideas of that our job is to be the complaining ministry. You know, this Sabbath school, uh, this morning Sabbath school is about spiritual gift, right? Uh, for those of us who have attended those uh, Sabbath school classes, you will know, and you will notice, and those of us who have watched us on Facebook, that this Sabbath school, uh, this week's Sabbath school lesson is about spiritual gift. Now, have you ever noticed whether there is a gift of complaining in many of the spiritual gift uh, listing, in many of the New Testament uh, expression of gift? None. So, complaining and murmuring is not a spiritual gift. Some of us think that my ministry in church, uh, to find out errors and complain it to the pastors, that's not a ministry. That is a problem. And I hope that we will not have such spirit anymore as we come back to have our potluck. So wh whether we are going to have two or three dishes only, let's try to do this. We will eat our food with gladness and we will have simplicity of heart that we don't have to portray ourselves as a very smart, very intelligent person. We just be simple. Just show the way we are. And once this formula that the Bible has given to us, we will be able to apply it. I personally believe we will see more and more young people will come and will join us. And I bet it's not only the young people will enjoy such community spirit with us, but whoever that will encounter us, young or old, from any backgrounds, the moment when they come and they feel the warmness of our church, they will find place with us. And we will, have, we will witness the beauty of the truth of the Bible being manifested in the real church life, whether it's in the New Testament time, but it can happen in our day today as well. So, Today, before we are going to have to end, uh, we, before we, we're going to end this worship time, let me ask us an honest question. You know, nowadays everywhere you go, uh, the, you know, you uh, everyone will will be screened for their temperature. But let me ask a question: If our church, you know, doing uh, having a temperature check as well, will they find our church warm? Or it's a very cold church. Now, I still remember an email that being sent to me 12 years ago when I preached about a similar sermon back in Ballastier when I was still an intern. And this person messaged me and said, Oh, Pastor, thank you for addressing the, the things that you have addressed in your sermon. To be honest with you, I rarely heard that this situation in our church being addressed and that is the coldness of our church that some of us, some of our members felt back then that as a church, we are very cold. We don't really interact openly. We don't really express emotions very much. We don't really feel the warmness of our church. Of course, along the way, things had improved. But I think we can improve even more. But let us ask this question. If anyone ever come, and join us in our worship service in this place once soon or later, once the live streaming service will be part of the real physical service once again. Will they feel the warmness of our church? Or they rather felt that, oh, this church is very cold. I don't feel very welcome over here. Number two, we believe that it takes a whole village to raise a child. Now, this saying needs to happen for us as well. Oftentimes, we think that we need, five, um, we need five children to take care of one adult. That one adult needs to monitor and to take care of five children. That is usually how we do Sabbath school classes, right? Or that is usually how we think about church leadership. One uh, adult members will take care of five youth under them. But I'm thinking the other way around. 
maybe starting from this quarter onwards, I would like to ask all these youth and young people in our church, do, can, they rec- can they identify at least five adults that are very close to them, that they can feel that these adults are very concerned and very caring about their life? Last week, Pastor Chia Hong had made the appeal to challenge every one of us to call or to contact at least one youth throughout the week. Now, how many of us, I, I cannot see your hand right now, and probably it spare you from, from having to, wit, to confess whether you have done it or not. But I would like to ask, have any one of us have done that? What Pastor Chia Hong have asked us last week, to try to call one youth and just to ask them, how are you today? So I will increase the challenge this week and I will, and I will ask Pastor Chen Rong as well to ask on any of our, all of our youth, do they have at least five of us adults who are really genuinely taking care and looking after them? Otherwise, this statement, it takes the whole village to raise a child, is just a saying. We don't really believe in it. But as we really want to look forward to see that they will be able to find place in our church. I would like to make this as a challenge for all of us. Let us not leave them thinking that the only people that are important in this church is only their pastors and their youth pastors and their youth sponsor alone. Let them realize that there are many genuine, loving, caring adults in our church who really care for them regardless of their appointment from the church. I really would like to hope that every one of them will be able to say that I I have at least five adults in our church that are really, really taking care of me, really talk to me, really make sure that I'm okay and so on and so forth. Because otherwise, we are not being genuine to the fact that we know that they need us as much as we need them. Because, to be honest with all of us this morning, I will not be able to hold back anymore a simple, soft message. I need to speak to all of us in this way. We cannot afford to lose many of our youth once more. As you look upon the numbers of our young young people in our church, how many of them are still with us? And to be honest with you, you know, some of you have asked me personally and I have answered you, in a way that, is, uh, that I hope will help us to understand. You know, they, they asked me, Pastor, what is your greatest burden? And I said, to be honest, I have no friends in church, both me and my family. And I'm not trying to say that none of you who are attending our church had become very unfriendly to us. No, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. But people of my age, people of my peers, people of my generation, how many of us are in the church today? In our Ballester church? People who share the same perspective, uh, idea, passion, energy, and resources like me. We can count them with, I can count them with my right hands alone. We cannot afford to lose them even further. My generation, at least in our church today, had totally been wiped away. If losing young people in the church is a pandemic, my age is one of the highest population that had been wiped away, decimated, whatever word that we have used in our church. We have a small group of the younger generation after me. And we have quite a large group of the young people who are now in national service and in their polytechnic. Church, we cannot lose them anymore. We cannot just let them go and think that, oh, what can we do? They want to go. We have done everything that we have, we have, we could. We cannot continue to think that it's okay for them to continue to leave the church and hoping that some miracle will happen simply because miracle will happen unless we take our part in doing what we need for the sake of our young people. I would like to make a personal appeal this morning. Let's do it. And we are not thinking about oh, buying them more stuff, pampering them with food, giving them gadgets and so on and so forth. No. All that we need to do is just to love them, to show that we are genuinely caring for them, that we are all here for them. 
And so, as we come to this end of this sermon, this will be my appeal. Church, let's build a loving community together. And as we build this community together, I pray that they will see that we are willing to change for the sake of change, for we know that they are important. They are matters in the eyes of the Lord, just like what Jesus said in my first sermon this quarter, that suffer not those little children, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Shall we bow head for a word of prayer? Father God, may your spirit dwell in art in us in order for us to move forward in our mission until the day Jesus comes again. And may the blessing of the Father bestowed upon us as we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And may the fellowship with the Holy Spirit will allow us to have this faith until Jesus comes again. For we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.